Yes, uh, welcome DM and good morning. DM? Yes, DM? good morning, Chair. I'm sorry, I was struggling with my mute. Oh, okay. <laughs> welcome, Dad. No, thank you very much, Chair, Chair, and uh, morning to committee members. Colleagues, uh, let me just uh, make a few remarks uh, whilst we are still waiting for uh, the colleague uh, from the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit to join the meeting. And uh, <clears throat> we, the matter before us uh, was brought to our attention, to the attention of the speaker, uh, who then referred it to us by uh, Mr. Denny Boy Peterson. Uh, Mr. Denny Boy Peterson is one of the founder members of the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit. The entity was registered in 2015 as an NPO. The entity was born to champion the interest of the Khoisan soldiers who were allegedly excluded from the SN. SANDF integration process. I didn't they, catch they claim that, that uh, <laughs> sorry, they claim that the reason why uh, they could not integrate was because of the termination of integration intake, intake act of 2001. Khoisan National Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit consists of volunteers drawn from the different uh, sections of Khoisan people. By joining the defense unit, members commit themselves to the open court, solemn and noble duty of serving our suffering and dispossessed Khoisan people in the struggle that will continue for each and uh, all of us until victory for recognition and integration of Khoisan soldiers into the new SNDF uh, close quote. In their papers, uh, the self-defense uh, unit states that under apartheid, the soldiers we knew too much. I, uh, they say they knew too much from the orders we followed. We were excluded from experiencing the new form of freedom as a rainbow nation. Instead, our soldiers became prisoners of hope and were excluded from the SNDF integration process since 1 September 1994, with no recognition to our Khoisan communities and uh, our Khoisan traditional leaders. A close quote. Mr. Peterson um, is also on record saying that their concern, that their concern is regarding uh, amnesty for integration of uh, or oh, their concern regarding amnesty for integration of Khoisan soldiers into the SA, SANDF has been raised with uh, President, former President Zuma, the Minister of Defense and uh, Military Veterans, uh, the Fifth uh, Parliament uh, Portfolio Committee on Defense and Military Veterans, the NCOP Select uh, Committee on uh, Justice and Security, um, the Constitutional Review Committee, and the SNDF itself. May I also add, colleagues, that the bodies that they raise their matter with uh, also include the, the Speaker of the National Assembly, Mem uh, the Military Ombuds, the Public Protector, the South African Law Reform Commission, the Human Rights Commission, and they've also, uh, you know, they also took the matter to court. Soon after this sixth parliament, uh, the, uh, this sixth parliament uh, portfolio committee on defense and military veterans, I mean this committee now, was inaugurated. The speaker, Memo Dise, referred the letter from the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit, 
requesting the, the portfolio committee to consider drafting legislation recognizing the Khoisan soldiers that served prior to 1994 as an eighth non-statutory force with the purpose of integrating them into the SNDF. Stanley Mathi, a central figure in the self-defense self unit and also founder member of the Kingdom Political Party, says they took government to court regarding what he termed as the exclusion of the Khoisan soldiers. Colleagues, today we are considering this matter. Sorry, this letter. I've asked Prince from the Parliamentary Legal, legal uh, Services to summarize the legal arguments and the key findings of the High Court that had the case, uh, the Khoisan case in, 20, in, 20, in 2012, as well as the key findings of the public protect. I've also requested uh, Peter Daniels and uh, Dr. Vele Mianse van Ranspeck, uh, content uh, advisor and uh, researcher, respectively, to research the South African military integration protest, process and matters connected therewith, and matters connect, connected with the Khoisan Self Defense Unit. I've also invited the Khoisan Self-Defense Unit to make its own uh, presentation today. Part of the presentation I specifically requested from them is the list of the S SACC uh, South African Cape Corps uh, ex-soldiers that they, that they claim to be speaking on their, on their behalf. I directed that the list must include the correct names ID numbers as well as force num the force numbers. The list they produced, colleagues, I want to put this up front. The list they produced had all sorts of areas, including people who were young when the SA SACC, the South African Cape Corps, was disbanded in 1992. The credibility of the list is in doubt, and it calls into question who they actually represent. The list is suspect. On one hand, they claim to represent the SACC uh, left out members. On the other hand, they claim to represent the Khoisan Revolutionary Forces styled uh, self-defense unit. It is when the two are conflated that the list ends up convoluted. The, the, the K, I mean, this, the, uh, the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit was non-existent at the time of integration. This was critical uh, because the reason why we sought for this information was critical because there is a history of various groups within the Khoisan community recruiting young and unemployed people, promising them integration into the SNDF in exchange for money. We must then be able to tell the difference between the list of the SACC members, the subject matter for the meeting today, and the list that were produced under the circumstances I've just mentioned. It is unfortunate that the court did not ask this question. Um, uh, we are not going to resolve today. We may need more information before we conclude on the matter. However, there will be an opportunity for clarity today. There will be an opportunity for clarity, seeking questions and guidance. Today is the first time that the Committee of Parliament has put this matter uh, on the program of Parliament as an agenda item and dealing and dealing with it directly. Before uh, the, it was dealt with in the context of, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, processing the termination of uh, integration intake uh, bill, and then later in 2015, when they were dealing with the um, defense laws uh, repeal and uh, an amendment uh, bill. So it was in the context of those two bills, the discussion on those two bills, that the matter was rose, rose and, and was discussed. Now, uh, colleagues, I hope the colleague has joined. Uh, Peter has, has uh, uh, sorry, Brian has joined, rejoined. Chair, Chair I, I still don't see Mr. Hope on the list. But uh, IT has informed me that they have communicated with him and he sh should have joined us by now. All right. Okay. 
All right, we will continue the meeting. What you do, Brian, um, I'm sure the meeting is recorded. That is correct. And if they, if they have missed any piece of the meeting, they will still be able to catch up uh, on the record of the meeting. Am, am, am I correct, Brian? That is correct, yes. Thanks. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Having made those uh, remarks, uh, colleagues, let me now invite um, uh, the researcher to take us through uh, the, he, the, the, the research work, and after which I will then ask the legal advisor to deal with uh, the legal uh, issues as it were. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Van Rensberg, Jans Van Rensberg. Thank you very much, Chair. I Thank you. just shared the screen. If you, if you can just uh, confirm whether we're showing on your side, it often takes a little while to come through. Yes, it is. It has come through, uh, Willem. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I will try to keep it as brief as possible. And you touched on some of the salient issues uh, of this already. Um, the instruction was to uh, just look at the integration process. And this was also requested by the legal services uh, to provide a background document, background research document on the Khoisan, uh, in, on the integration process as a whole. and um uh research on the the case of the Khoisan, Na Khoisan nation self-defense unit so what i'll be discussing today in brief is a um an overview of the integration process uh defining what self-defense units actually are uh, sorry in the case of the Khoisan, interject, yes. interject. welcome mr uh, hope i see as rejoined the meeting Mr. Hope? All right, I think he uh, still has challenges. You may continue, sir. You uh, may continue, thank Valen. you, Chair. So uh, the, the, on the scope, just to continue or to, to, to go over it again, I will provide a brief overview of the integration process itself. Um, the funding self-defense units actually are the, Khoisan, the case of the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit, speaking to that a little bit, as well as, well as the SACC, um, and then looking at general concerns with uh, regarding the uh, personnel register that was submitted by the uh, Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit, and then just some key issues for uh, to go forward with. Um, bear in mind, uh, Chairperson and members, that this research is based on existing reading and literature that, that was found, and the, the aim of today's presentation is to just to highlight some topics to facilitate further discussion between the relevant stakeholders in this regard. Um, to go to the next slide, in terms of the integration process, I'm going to run through this fairly quickly because I, I think members might be uh, familiar with this, specifically members on this committee uh, might be very familiar with this, uh, with this process. But um, to provide context, uh, the integration process uh, formed part of the broader political process around the Codesa talks uh, before 1994's transition to democracy. And there was, in addition to the political process, there was a parallel military process that started in 1990, uh, if not earlier, with talks between the uh, former South African Defense Force military commanders and Mkwanto Isizwe's military commanders. So the military and political processes back in the day was highly intertwined and uh, it was required that these run concurrently. The integration process between, uh, in terms of the military, took place between the statutory forces, which refers to the old South African Defence Force, as well as the uh, Defence Forces of the various um, TBVC states. Uh, on the one hand, so those were the statutory forces, and then you had the non-statutory forces um, on the other hand, which was Nkonto Isizwe uh, and the Azanian People's Liberation Army, or in Apla, as it's very well known. Uh, so those were the main role players in terms of the integration process. Uh, a product, a research product that was put out by the Speaker of the National Assembly now, Ms. Tani Mudise, she, uh, she pointed out um, that there were two, two phases to this integration process. First, there was a phase related to the Joint Military Coordinating Council, or the JMCC, which ran from November 1993 to April 1994. Um, 
And during this time, and the relevant parts to today's discussion is the following. During this time, all the uh, forces that form part of the integration process, so all the forces that I just mentioned, both statutory and non-statutory, had to submit a list of personnel to the JMCC to form part of the certified personnel register. So all the names from the statutory and non-statutory forces were put together, and this list, this certified personnel register, formed the backbone of the integration list and the integration process. Um, however, she also pointed out that the CVR uh, was, was a problem for the non-statutory forces, uh, specifically MK and APLA had problems with this due to the informal nature of, of the resistance movements. So what, was, what happened then is that the JMCC allowed for a non-formal CPR to be created and that was added to the original uh, CPR by August 1995. So we saw a process where there was flexibility to allow additional members to, uh, to come in. At the end of the day, the formal CPR consisted of a total of 135,927 people that needed to be integrated into the new South African National Defence Force. The second part of this integration process was the actual uh, integration process itself. Sorry, let me get to the right slide. There we go. Um, and uh, here I'd like to, uh, to point out two, uh, or sorry, this is also part of the first um, phase of the integration process. What was key to note here is that after the flexibility around the uh, certified personnel registers, it should also be noted that two self-defense units were included in this in this process. Firstly, uh, with regards to some controversies, way in the book by Lenny Heineken, she she notes the following that the actual strength prior to integration for for MK ranged from about 5,000 to 12,000 members, but its rank swelled to 22,000 members when the self-defense units operating within the country were counted in. So there was expansion in this regard to include self-defense units related to Nkondo uh, Sizwe. Similarly, we saw around 2,000 members of the KwaZulu Self-Protection Force in, uh, forming part of the integration process. Um, these members had to enlist as new recruits in the South African National Defence Force. They had to complete basic training and they had to go through the ranks. That was the uh, uh, condition for their in, in, uh, inclusion. So I just wanted to show the process that there was the CPR, the Certified Personal Registers, there was flexibility around it, and it was included in two self-defence units. Uh, the next phase of the integration process was the four-year phase between 1994 and 1998 um, that actually dealt with the actual integration of, um, of military personnel into the SANDF. The process that's relevant to today's discussion is that there was a placement board, and this placement board oversaw the placement of forces within the specific new SANDF units. Um, the placement boards consisted of members of the SADF uh, the, and uh, TVC commanders um, on the one hand, and it also consisted of commanders of the non-statutory forces. So it was a neutral field that looked at each and every individual and where they would fit into the SANDF. The process was also overseen by the British Military Advisory Training Team uh, as a neutral observer, and they also advised on, on the management of this process. Um, where where non-statutory force members were uh, found not to have the correct qualifications or skills, uh, retraining was offered or vocational training was offered to these uh, individuals to fit them into the, into the system. So on the, on the one hand, you had this integration process and this placement of personnel, but on a parallel process, we also saw a demobilization process taking place. And the aim of this was to shrink the size of the SANDF. Um, earlier I mentioned the figure of 135,900 um, soldiers that formed part of the integration list, and this was considered to be too big of military uh, to sustain. So they, this demobilization process formed part of shrinking the, the overall size of the SANDF after integration. Um, the other reason for this was to minimize security risks uh, within the, the context of the time. Um, and the, practically, this played out through vocational training offered to members so that they could exit the military and use their vocational training skills 
in the uh, in the private sector, and also cash demobilization packages uh, were handed out. So uh, individuals got cash payments for uh, for the demobilization process. Chair, before I carry on to the next slide, the key point of this uh, overview of the integration process is to point out that it was a challenging and complex process, but there were various checks and balances introduced uh, in this process. Like we saw the placement, which was neutral objective, the uh, advisory British uh, military team that, that formed an external uh, perspective on this and an external advisory capacity. There was even a parliamentary uh, role in this. Parliament had a committee to look specifically at the integration process. Uh, so there was a number of, um, there was flexibility first in terms of the uh, personnel registers and also uh, a number of checks and balances, including Parliament, to make sure that the integration process is fair, was fair and just notwithstanding that it was a very complex um, process. Uh, moving on then to self-defense units, and it's, there's limit, limited literature available uh, regarding self-defense units as well, but there's a, a writing that sort of summarizes the main focus around self-defense units uh, um, back in the day by Everett and Jennings. And just to, to summarize this, they say within South Africa, Within South Africa, the escalating conflict gave rise to a new internal infrastructure for the ANC. MK cadres and UDF supporters began to organize self-defense units in the townships, and the ANC leadership called for citizens to make the country ungovernable. In areas outside KwaZulu and Natal, ANC and UDF supporters were clashing with police. KwaZulu uh, Natal, the STUs were also clashing with Encarta supporters who were organized into vigilante groups known as Amabuto. Many of these were formal rural areas and, uh, sorry, many of these were from uh, rural areas and passed into urban townships to take on those involved in boycotts and anti apartheid activities. This is just to give a, a short background of, of the development of, of STUs around uh, the transition period. But how do we draw that then to the case of the Khoisan uh, nation self-defense unit, as they state uh, in their name. Um, an initial reading of available text, there was no indication of the existence of, a, of an entity called the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit during the integration period. And this could perhaps be open up for further discussion by members uh, going forward. But this statement or this finding in lit or the lack of literature of was confirmed in 2015, when a DOD legal advisor noted to this committee that questions have been raised about the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit as they did not fall within the prescripts of Section 2 to 4 of the Interim Constitution. The Self-Defense Unit was non-existent at the time and because of integration was terminated in 2001. So this raises the question then, uh, and this is one of the key points uh, where clarification is needed, as you, as you rightly noted, uh, Chair, um, is who does the Khoisan Nation uh, self-defense unit represent? In the submission that they made to Parliament, um, there is reference to the Khoisan and there's reference to the South African Cape War. But the fact is that there are a number of ex uh, competing or existing groups that claim to rep be representing uh, Khoisan interests in terms of their, their military units uh, or other Khoisan interests. And there's even the South African Cape Corps Military Veterans Association, which is now a, mil a military veterans association, which is recognized by the Department of Military Veterans. So they also uh, represent the interests of, of former SACC members as the, uh, as the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit claims to represent. So there's this disparity. Let's just quickly look then at the SACC, who they are and where they come from. The SACC was established in 1963 as the SAK, uh, sorry, as the SA Colored Corps in 1970s was renamed as the SA Cape Corps, and it was first deployed as an infantry unit uh, in 1976. From being a support military unit for the old SADF to becoming a fully fledged infantry unit. And by the 1980s, we saw three SACC units that existed around the country uh, in, in Kimberley and, and Cape Town. And they were closed down in March of 1992 
Uh, and we saw the opening of nine side battalion, which members are familiar with here in, in Cape Town. So that is just a two sentence background of the SACC. Um, now, if you look at the, the question, non-integration of the Khoisan and the SACC, as put to Parliament by the uh, Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit, there's two issues to this. The first the issue of, the, of Khoisan and the second is the S issue of the SAC, former SACC members. Uh, on the first issue around the Khoisan, around the integration process, there was no indigenous Khoisan SADF unit. Um, there was there was some Khoisan members that have served in some other SADF units, including in the SACC. There were also some uh, indigenous Khoisan uh, people that served in uh, from Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia, that formed part of 3-1 Battalion, which is a former South African Defense Force Union. The point is that all Khoisan who served under the SADF structures back in back before 1994, they would have formed part of the of the South African Defense Forces integration phase. Um, they would have been represented by the South African Defense Force in the integration phase. Bearing in mind that that was a complex process and not all SADF members were eligible for integration. There were a number of criteria, for example, the contract that they had uh, determined um, the eligibility for integration. So that's the one aspect of it around the Khoisan. The other aspect is around the SACC. And the fact is that some SACC members did integrate um, into the SADF as part uh, as part of the SADF back in the day. Um, and there are a lot of other options available to um, to SACC members. Some, uh, some may have opted for demobilization, some may not have qualified uh, for placement in, in integration uh, by the placement boards, some may have opted to join the reserve force, and some may not have qualified for integration as they were on short-term contracts. And that's an important point uh, to keep in mind. Um, there was criteria for eligibility for integration and not all SACC members necessarily qualified for this. And this was confirmed in 2014 by a response from the Department of Defense to a parliamentary question. So in 2014 it was indicated that by then 2,361 former SACC members were actively serving in the SAND. That shows you that a number of uh, former SACC members did integrate into the SNDF. Um, in two th 2006 of them completed two years voluntary service, uh, 1,000 of them uh, auxiliary service, 1,000 of, uh, of them volunteer commander service, and 4,000 of them were permanent force. The, the point of this of this breakdown shows you uh, that many of the SACC members did integrate, firstly, um, but it is a very diverse group, uh, and they were they were serving in the SANF on different contracts and different conditions, and this affected how they would have integrated into the uh, uh, into the SANF, uh, noting that they formed part of the SANF structures back then. Moving to the next slide, um, members, the general concerns with the uh, Khoisan Nation Self Defense Units. Um, certified personnel register that they submitted to this committee. Uh, Chair and members, it's the, the, aim of the, it's the aim of the research unit to, advise, to provide um, objective input for further discussions. So it couldn't be left out to provide members with a brief overview of uh, what the list that they submitted reflected. And a, a, a look at the list reveals a number of facts, and that is that the list is generally of a poor quality. Um, it is an unnumbered list, so it is unclear exactly how many members um, are represented by the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit. Uh, a lot of names are at some of the at the end of the list is written in it. It's, uh, incomplete details of members are also captured on this list. Sometimes initials are missing, sometimes ID numbers are missing, sometimes uh, names are missing um, and we've had more than one list submitted or different parts of the list submitted and this brings into question the, the the concept of being a certified list it's unclear how this how this process of certification took place how did they certify um, 
the list as a whole. Um, very importantly, also the force numbers and suffixes are incomplete, and we did request uh, this further information from the coordination of the defense unit, and they did they did not provide this. Um, all members of the former South African Defence Force and the current South African National Defence Force have an eight-digit force number. At the end of the eight-digit force number, there's two letters, and those letters indicate what type of contract these individuals have with the with the uh, defence force, whether it's short-term, long-term, permanent, volunteer. Uh, it, it differs, and it's determined by those two two letters. A list submitted by the Coalition Nation Self Defense Unit, those letters were not included, so it's very difficult to tell what type of contracts the people that they represent served on prior to 1994 and had an impact on whether they were eligible for integration um, into the South African National Defense Force. Uh, another factor is that members on this list that they submitted were often of younger people born in 1988 up to uh, past the 1990s. And these people will then obviously not qualify for integration as they were either not yet born during the integration period or might have been very young during this period. And that, that raises a bigger question around integration. The, the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit submitted the list with the aim to integrate. And it's unclear why this young people is then on the list because they're obviously not qualify for uh, for integration. Furthermore, there's a number of deceased individuals included on the list, and the purpose of that is unclear. It also uh, complicates the, the list itself, and it's also very unclear when the list was last updated. So keeping that in mind, uh, uh, members, the, the conclusion, the, the main aspect to take from this for discussion further is, firstly, that it is unclear from the submission and from the readings of, of existing literature uh, of the integration process, it is unclear who exactly the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit represents. On the one hand, they have Khoisan interest. On the other hand, you have the uh, SACC issue. It is disappointing that it needs to be, be clarified. Secondly, the poor quality of the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit Certified Personnel Register brings into question their sub the submission um, in terms of the, the quality of, of the submission itself. And um, it, it raises the question whether the, the individuals can captured on that list, whether the details are correct, and whether they're actually eligible for integration as per the standards uh, set. And thirdly, there seems to be a conflation between the concepts of integration and military veterans aspects. Um, if, for example, young individuals are included on the list, like those born after, any, anybody on the list born after 1977, for example, they would have been ineligible for integration into the military. Um, however, some of them served in the South African National Defense Force. On the list that they submitted, there are individuals with South African National Defense Force, force numbers. These individuals would then automatically, as per the definition, qualify to be military veterans. So why are they included on a list related to integration? So there seems to be this, a discrepancy in terms of whether this deals with integration or military veterans aspect. And lastly, um, the submission that, that the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit made uh, clearly states that they wish to reopen the integration process even beyond the Khoisan and SACC matter. So just I'm just raising this as a, as a talking point for members as well. Um, because if if this is the wish of the Khoisan Nation Self Defense Unit, it will it will open up the entire process again. And uh, as we will hear in the next presentation, this will have legislative implications, uh, given that the integration process was formally closed. Um, in conclusion, Chair, there's a number of, of issues. If we look back, this is a, it's a complex issue, the integration integration issue. There was flexibility to include. To, to include members that felt that the integration process was unfair. It was a flexible but complex issue. Um, we are now far along the line, and there's some, some major concerns that needs to be uh, ironed out uh, in, in the discussions going forward by the committee. Thank you, Chair. I, I hope that the uh, presentation helped to uh, further discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Willem. You've done, you've done very well. Um, 
uh, we've also were, were able to uh, stay within the time allocated. Let me now quickly uh, invite uh, Mr. Prince, Michael Prince, the legal advisor, uh, just to give us. Uh, I said, sorry, I said the matter has been to court, uh, it has also been to the public protector. And uh, the legal advisor, Mr. Prince, will summarize the key findings, um, uh, the key arguments and key findings, and uh, as were presented uh, by the court or in court, uh, as well as the key findings um, uh, by the pro public protector. So that would be in a summary that will be presented in a minute from now. Let me invite you, Mr. Prince, on the key findings and the, the arguments and the findings by the courts and also the key findings by the public protect. Thank you, Chair. And again, from my side, good morning and good morning to the members. Um, let me just try to share my screen. Yeah, now chair. it's uh, online. Yes. I, are you able to see my screen, Chair, the presentation? Yes. Can you just uh, zoom it on it? Zoom on it then. Make it bigger. Uh, I'll try to do so, Chair. Um, there you are. No, no, is it's that, fine. Is, is, is no, that no. better? It's it's okay now. Yeah. Okay, Chair, like you explained earlier on, Chair, my presentation deals with two matters. Firstly, a 2010 High Court matter, and secondly, a public protector's report based on a complaint received from the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit. That was in 2015. Chair, I'd like to start with the, with the High Court matter. The High Court matter was a matter involving Mr. Stanley George Matea, on behalf of the Khoisan Kingdom All People Party versus the Minister of Defence. Um, in this matter, the applicant sought an order um, to direct the respondents, being the Minister of Defence, to engage in negotiations with the Khoisan soldiers with regards to the integration into the South African National Defence Force within a 30-day period. It further sought the court to direct the respondents to conclude the decision to integrate or not before 31 December 2010. Um, Chair, the respondents, um, being the Department of Defense, submitted in their papers that because the integration process um, has been concluded, the applicants did not have any right to protect and therefore the application should not succeed. Um, they also submitted that the order sought to, uh, which was to meet the minister, had no practical value because there was no legislative framework to integrate the Khoisan soldiers into the South African National Defence Force. They finally said that the applicants had failed to establish any cause of action, Chair. The applicants in return submitted that they were relying on legitimate expectation in their application. They said that the legitimate expectation was created um, by the department when it sent a letter to the applicants. Um, by the, the letter was sent by the then Deputy Director General. The letter purported to, um, to request a meeting um, to be held between the Khoisan representatives of the Khoisan soldiers and the department to discuss um, a possible integration into the South African National Defence Force. The Chair, the High Court, um, in considering the matter, referred to various case laws dealing with um, legitimate expectation. 
The first one being that of the Minister of Defence versus Dunn, which was a 2007 judgment in which the, um, in which the Supreme Court of Appeal held that legitimate expectation does not protect every expectation. It gave a, a, a list of requirements of what legitimate expectation would be and when it will be protected. The, um, the High Court also referred to a matter of Walele versus the city of Cape Town, which was a 2008 matter, um, in which the court said that legitimate expectation was, um, whether a legitimate expectation was made is a factual test. Taking all of these into consideration, the High Court in the Matia matter held, firstly, um, that the applicants did not belong to a political party, um, neither have they formed a political party. The court said that there was no proof that the applicants were a properly registered political party, and, and therefore the, they would have to be dealt with as individual applicants. Um, they further, the court further said that there was no legal framework in terms of which the department could integrate the Khoisan soldiers into the South African National Defence Force, and that the applicants therefore does not have a legitimate expectation. Um, based on all of these, Chair, the court dismissed the application. Moving on to the um, public protectors report in 2015, Chair, um, like I said, this report was based on a complaint received from the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit. The complaint um, related to, and I quote, an undue delay on the part of the South African National Defense Force to integrate members of the Khoisan Na Nation Self-Defense Unit during the integration process, which took place in April 1994. Um, in evaluating the complaint chair, the, the public protector firstly um, invited the department to respond to the complaint. The, the department indicated that the integration process was closed in terms of the Termination of Integration Act, which was a 2001 Act, and this was also confirmed, according to the department, by the High Court matter of Stanley Matia, the matter that I just referred to earlier. The, accordingly, the South African National Defence Force said that they considered the matter as finalised. The public protector also consulted um, applicable legislation and various legal prescripts, um, first of which was Section 224 of the Interim Constitution. This section established the now South African National Defence Force. It also considered the Termination of Integration Act. Um, which fixed the cutoff date for integration um, as the 31st of March 2002. They also looked at the High Court matter of Stanley Matia, which we've just discussed. And the public protector found that based on the, firstly, based on the South African National Defence Force response and the applicable legal prescripts, they found that the South African National Defence Force refusal to integrate the Khoisan soldiers at the time was lawfully justified. Um, the public protector said that they could not make, they could therefore not make any findings or take any remedial action that conflict with the prevailing legislation and jurisprudence. The public protector therefore closed the complaint. Chair, that brings me to the end of my presentation. It was very short, it only dealt with those two matters. I tried to summarize it as best I could. I hope that will be of assistance to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank, you so, thank you so much, Michael uh, Prince. Uh, you've done very well uh, in summarizing the, the, the items. Colleagues, um, so these are the two presentation. May I quickly invite uh, Mr. Hawke to give us uh, his side of the uh, presentation before I open it up for limited discussions, uh, just questions of clarity and also guidance, because the matter will, have, will still have to come back, uh, you know, so that we can then finally close it uh, neatly. And uh, Mr. Hawk, are you back? Have you rejoined us? Mr. Hawk? All right. 
I can see Mr. Hope is, is connected, uh, but I don't understand why uh, maybe there is, it doesn't, uh, we're not audible on, on, on his side. Mr. Hope? Uh, Brian? Uh, it seems, Mr. Hope, I don't know whether it is gadget uh, that has a problem uh, because from my side, I should be unable to unmute him, but then it does not allow me to do so. But the IT person? Uh, uh, if, even the IT person had spoken to him, uh, he seems to be also experiencing that challenge. But he was he listening to the presentation he, from from the indication that I have from him, it's that he's a, a able to view us, but then right. he's unable to communicate with us. I see. All right. Um, colleagues, we are now faced with this situation. Let me then uh, open it up for uh, uh, comments. And uh, lastly, just to get clarity on areas that you may think are, were not clear um, enough. And um, may I invite you, colleagues? Is a way where you indicate by a show of hand, yeah, and um, there isn't. Uh, all right, doesn't like yes. Uh, uh, General Loremis, I can see your hand. Any other hand, colleagues? Uh, my hand is on. Uh, that is Shelembe. All yeah, right. Cool. Okay. The, that's General Loremisa. Uh, Ryder as well, please. Sir. Mr. Ryder. Um, and who else? All right. Let me stay with these three hands for now. Uh, who's that? All right. Let me stay with these three hands for now. Uh, General Lodemisa, you may come in first, please. Uh, thank you, Chairperson and colleagues. It's a pity that the uh, representative of uh, of this unit is not is unable to join us. It would have been good to hear his side of the story, especially after they have lost the case in the Supreme Court as well as at uh, the Public uh, Protector's uh, Office. My question is merely procedural. If these gentlemen, they are, what exactly do they want Parliament to do? Because the Defense, Department of Defense has already responded to them and they have lost the case. The next step one would have expected them to do would have been to appeal to Bloemfontein, to the Appeals Court. How do we feature in at this stage? That's a question. Thank you. Thanks, General. Uh, Mr. Shiller. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, Chairperson, uh, I'm also sharing the same sentiment as uh, General Lomesa. I mean, I said that, I mean, they, they have lost the case in court. And my question is, why is the Speaker of Parliament is referring at this to this portfolio committee, whereas there is, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the court ruling that uh, the applicant has um, failed, I mean, uh, in its, I mean, uh, application. Then, uh, two, uh, under the general concerns that, I mean, are here, you see uh, where they say there are a lot of... Uh, anomalies in that list, like, I mean, um, the numbers, uh, the issue of, I mean, uh, the young ones, as uh, they were born in 1998. Now, 
if say that list of I mean the whole sign uh, nation uh, SDU, I mean uh, was I mean uh, did not have any anomalies. Was the department going to consider it? Because now, you know, if you look and say one of the issues are just the general concerns when it comes to the certified uh, personal uh, register. So now if these, I mean, there were no anomalies on that certified personal register, was the department going to, I mean, uh, consider it? Then two, um, I'm worried about, I mean, uh, the letter that came from uh, the Deputy, Di Deputy Director General of the Department uh, of the of defense and military veterans, where, I mean, uh, they created the expectation. Yes, I agree that, well, that expectation has been uh, turned down. But I just want to know why did the direct, deputy director wrote the letter, I mean, uh, to engage them, and then all, all of a sudden, and then did not engage them. So I think maybe if uh, that can be uh, clarified, I mean, I will I will be, uh, be happy. I'm just checking where, uh, another uh, I think maybe um, Jansen van Rensburg will uh, explain, I mean, that uh, to me. It's about, I mean, when we speak of, I mean, uh, they, they, I mean, uh, the, C, the CPR register, are we saying they were once part of uh, the South African Defense Force? That's number one. Two, uh, he spoke of the Wazulu Self-Protection Forces, if he can be able to explain clearly that what Zulu Self Protection Air Force is talking about, is it uh, what I'm thinking of at uh, the Self Protection Unit or is something else rather than that uh, Self Protection Unit that used to exist in KZN? Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Mr. Schellenbe. Mr. Ryder? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, Yes, I think that it's a big pity that we haven't had an opportunity to have a presentation uh, from the the, the uh, question community. I think that would have given us a lot more clarity because, I, look, my first question is quite simple, and that is what what relief is sought? Uh, what are they actually looking for um, from the Defence Force? Uh, you know, are they looking to be recognised as military veterans? Uh, or are they still looking at, at, at being included in the um, in the defence force in some way, shape, or form? Uh, Twenty-five years later, I think that would be quite a stretch. But but it, it would be helpful to know what what relief is sought by by the the, the claimants. Then the, the next question just relates to when when this, the, these claims were first made. Obviously, there was an integration phase that that started in. Uh, I believe 1991 uh, and continued right up to 1998 uh, in various forms, the formal integration phase being from 94 to 98. But when when was there first an application made by, by the Khoisang um, um, Staff Defence Unit? Uh, did they only start making a noise in 2009 or was there some, some correspondence before that? Um, then there's a so, couple so, of comments well, about I've the lost, list. Sorry, Mr. Yeah? Mr. Rod, I've lost you. Can you repeat the last question? Sure. Sorry, Chairperson. Just, just when, when was the, um, when, when did they first apply uh, for integration? Was it, uh, was it only in 2010 or 29, or, or was it uh, long before that in the 1990s? The next point, the next question, and I, it's 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 my last or second last. So the, there's there's comments about the list now. I don't believe that having deceased on individuals on the list is problematic because um, people are dying all the time. So it, would, it may just be a factor of not keeping it 100 percent up to date. I do have a concern with the youngsters. Um, if we can have just a sample, uh, maybe just one page of the list distributed to the committee, so that we can have a look at the. Um, uh, the quality issues or the concerns that that, that have been raised. Um, and then my very last point relates to the question of, you know, we, we have a court judgment. Um, the comments from the legal advisor indicate that, that court judgment is of quite a technical nature and that the, um, uh, the application may not have been legal, but 
considering that the speaker has referred it to us perhaps as a moral obligation, uh, and I think that's often an issue, and it's an issue that the public protector has picked up in the past on several of her findings, uh, though I note not this one, where uh, the issue is that the law the law is not always moral. So there may be a moral obligation to consider this. So as, as such, if the committee can submit, if the secretariat can send to us, please, a copy of that judgment, as well as a copy of the public protector's report for us to study, um, noting that you've said that we're not going to conclude on the matter today. But I think that that would just be some additional reading that may place the entire matter into in, into a slightly better context. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Ryder. Right, uh, uh, colleagues, let me now uh, ask uh, the two presenters uh, to deal with the uh, questions as, as raised. I will then come in in the event there is a question that um, you may not ask, uh, which I can best uh, do. I now invite uh, your colleagues, uh, uh, Prince and Yance uh, van Rosbeck. I start with you, uh, Dr. Shaw. Okay, over to you, sir. Thank you, Chair. I, I will just uh, briefly respond to the two questions posed by Mr. Shilembe. Um, you first referred to whether some of the uh, members um, on the list of the Koisna Nation Self Defense Unit were part of the old SADF. Um, the answer to that is in, in, in brief terms is yes. Some of them were part of the old South African Defense Force. Um, and those, specific, those, those relate specifically to former SACC members. The SACC was a unit within the uh, South African Defence Force, and the Khoisan Nation Self-Defence Unit claimed to represent some of the former SACC members. So yes, some of the people on the list were former members of the SACC. And on the list that is indicated with force numbers, um, we did request a, a refined list from them. Only containing members that were formerly part of the SACC. They didn't provide this, um, so we're not clear. Uh, there's only some indication on one of the lists uh, of people who belong to the SACC. It's not a comprehensive uh, broken down list. Um, but in short, yes, some of them did belong to the old SADF. Uh, and in brief, your question around the KwaZulu, uh, KwaZulu self-defense uh, unit. Yes, I was referring to the self-protection units that functioned uh, in the region. Uh, prior to 1994. Thank you. I confirm the two answers as we have uh, uh, outlined, uh, Doc. I now invite Prince. Mr. Prince. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, the, the issue about the court judgment and the PPC report, um, yes, we, are, we, we can make that available to the committee. Um, I will forward the, both the report and the judgment through to the committee secretary to distribute to committee members, Chair. Okay. Chair. Yes, you're done. All yes, right. Chair. Thank you so much. Right, let me just tackle the other two questions. Um, I think Mr. Schiller asked uh, whether um, was basically asking why are we uh, taking so much interest in the inconsistencies uh, in in the list? If if there were no consistencies, what would have been the status of our discussion? No, uh, I want to say that um, the reason why we needed them to give us the list was to of, of the it was because they were claiming to be speaking on behalf of a group of people so we want to know who are these people that they're claiming to be speaking on their on on, on behalf in that way we asked them to give us the list and uh, so that list as i said is suspect it doesn't it, it calls into question even the 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 the, the validity of the the, the, the claim, um, and we even said that uh, if the court had looked at the list, maybe they would have, uh, you know, uh, looked at the matter differently. Yes, they were right in finding that the matter is closed, but they still opened the door for a discussion 
uh, between the, the the unit and and the minister. But given the list, it it, it questions into it it calls into question even the the the, the legitimacy of the body. Uh, whether it is uh, legitimate that they should speak on behalf of the people they don't know. I think that was the the, 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 the issue. And then the other point um, Shellenbe raised was why is the speaker referring the matter uh, to, to us? Because it's clear from the court record that the, the, the fellows uh, did not have a case, they, or rather they lost the case. No. I think it's, it's it's by right that when the speaker uh, receives a letter, uh, uh, he must then refer it to the relevant the portfolio committee, which must then advise him on how to uh, advise him on how to uh, deal with it. So, uh, at the conclusion of this process, we'll produce a report, and then with our recommendation, and just send it back to the speaker. The speaker will then communicate the findings uh, to, uh, the, to, to, to the author of the letter. So that's how it goes. Um, on the, I think there is a question that a general asked, uh, what exactly do they want us to do? In the letter general, they wrote to the speaker, they are saying, they are requesting the portfolio committee to consider drafting legislation uh, recognizing the Khoisan soldiers that served prior to 1994. Uh, you know, so basically they want us to reinstate the integration process. That's, and uh, why they're doing it is because both the court and the public protector said there is now no legal basis for any integration uh, to happen. They now ask us to create that legal basis. Now, the, the, the question before us is whether the, 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 there is any justifiable reason for us to even think about that. Hence, we, we said they must come and present uh, their case uh, before us. Um, <clears throat> yes, I think that also address the question uh, Mr. Ryder raised, uh, what, is, uh, what, what is the relief sought? Uh, that's what they are asking. And uh, I think there's a question that has not been asked, answered, uh, on the, whether the, when they first uh, applied, when they first uh, launched their application, was it before, was it in 2010 or 2009 or earlier? And uh, I think they only came into existence. I mean, this case, I think we're dealing with the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit. It came into existence in 2015, right? And uh, right. And then the, the other body that took the matter to court, I don't know when it came into existence, but they only brought the matter to court in, 20, in 2010. I can't answer for anything that might have actually happened much earlier. And uh, Mr. Prince would, uh, or Mr. or Dr. Uh, uh, Janse van Rensberg, can you shed light on that? Whether the matter was ever raised before the authorities, before uh, it came to court and to the public protect. Uh, Chair, um, perhaps there's uh, another view from the legal services. Um, I, I, I don't have the legal history, whether they actually approached the courts before that, but just in terms of uh, existence, um, there was no, in, as far as the literature uh, goes, there was no indigenous uh, Khoisan self-defense unit similar to other self-defense unit during the period of integration. So um, if you compare it to, for example, the KwaZulu self-defense or self-protection units or the MKSTUs, um, there was no equivalent structure within the Khoisan community uh, during the integration process that I could see from the existing literature. Okay, thank you so much. And, uh, Prince, do you want to add? Um, Chair, no, just to say that the, according to my records, the only legal case that was brought in 2010, um, 
As for official request to the department, um, maybe the department can shed light into that. We don't have any evidence to suggest that there were earlier requests brought. Um, but if I work through the submission received from the COSA nation, there seems to be a, su a suggestion that they have requested, they have um, submitted various requests to the department in the past. Um, I don't have anything official in terms of dates, Chair. Thank you. All right. Okay, so colleagues, that's where we are uh, at the moment. Uh, has has Mr. Hope joined us? Uh, Hope, Mr. Hope? Right. It doesn't look like... Uh, yes, sir? Chairperson, this is ICT support. Uh, we've been in contact with Mr. Hop, but we have discovered that he's currently using a desktop and he doesn't have a device which will allow him to integrate his mic and the sound. So he can currently see the presentations, but he doesn't have sound and he, and he also cannot give input to us because he doesn't have a device that will enable him to give us sound from his desktop. So unfortunately, we cannot resolve that um, today. Okay. No, okay, no, it's fine. Uh, but we have already resolved that uh, whichever way we'll still send the record uh, to, to them so that they are then able to catch up with the discussions. I thought by now they would have joined, right? Now, uh, DM, uh, do you want to just uh, comment uh, on the matter? Uh, are there any other hands, colleagues, before we... Close the matter. I can't. Yes, general. Yes. Like, yes. Okay, I'll come back to you, uh, DM and the general. Any other hand, colleagues? Tabu? Yes, I want to just clarity on something. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, any other uh, hand, colleagues? I, I, uh, Tabo, are you wanting to speak? Right, uh, Mr. Mutle. All right, I will take the 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 Inkosi uh, uh, Honourable Mutle, uh, General Olmesa, and then uh, lastly, I will then ask the the the, the DM to give us his comments, and uh, so it will be in that order. Ndabezeta. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning to your chair and our members, uh, the, uh, the, those uh, represented on, 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 the, on the issue. Chairperson, in fact, um, my question or question of clarity in the presentation, a mention was, was made of, of some of the members of the, the Khoisan community who are Namibians by origin. And, you know, with a uh, the Khoisan Defense Unit has just been uh, uh, put before, before us to say they were the, the, the rest of, 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 the, of the members were excluded in, 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 in the SND, the PCC as well, who has been said uh, they form part of, of the, 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 the Defense Force, South African National Defense Force. My, my question is what happened to the Namibians? Are they, do they form part still of, of the SNDF or they were excluded? And if so, why were they excluded? Because obviously they were part of the unit during those apparent days when they were used by the South African uh, Defense Force in, in, in uh, fighting uh, the, 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 the liberators of our country. Uh, That's the main question, Chairperson. And lastly, the concern uh, I have is that of you know, as has been put here, that uh, the, the the case of the this group, the Khoisan uh, uh, Party, as, as, as has been uh, 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 projected, was was sort of uh, dismissed in court. Um, maybe one fact that I, that comes to my mind, Chairperson, is that those people who who project themselves as as the representative of those committees, they were only doing so because they wanted recognition that they are leaders in their own capacity 
and they were threatening the state in, in, in some form to say they have a party of those members, they have the throwing of those members of, 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 of those members who were, were excluded, plus the communities as such, because you know these days people are trying their level best to gain whatever access they can to the state so that they could maybe mirror some resources from the state. That's the, the, concerns, the last concern that I have, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debezita. Uh, Mr. Mutle. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, let me welcome the two presentation because uh, they bring us, uh, they brought us into speed in terms of uh, understanding the core issues uh, around the matter raised uh, uh, by the Khoisan uh, National Self-Defense Unit. Uh, it is quite unfortunate that uh, they are unable to to present their their issue in front of us, so that uh, we have a full uh, understanding from both sides, from the research perspective, and their own understanding of uh, 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 matters out of, uh, as to how they unfolded. Because uh, I'm still asking myself, even now, Chair, uh, if they were inexistent during the process of integration, why didn't they make means to ensure that uh, they are not left behind during that uh, particular process? And they then come later, yes, after the process has been completed. It's something that uh, is is puzzling me. But however, however, chair, we we appreciate uh, you convening this meeting so that uh, we 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 come uh, into speed with these issues. Uh, and when we've got all the information, we are that will then be empowered to then uh, make uh, correct inputs or recommendation into the matter. Uh, for now, I think, Chair, I don't know how we are going to deal with the fact that they could not uh, present due to challenges that they face. Maybe we'll have a second meeting uh, where we'll have to listen to their side of story. Uh, because I think it, it will only be fair that we also listen to them and ask them a few questions so that they clarify us uh, going forward. Thank you, Chair. Yes, no, th thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Mutke. Uh, Honorable General Olomesa. Thank you, Chairperson. Mine is to suggest a way of handling this case. Given that you have already confirmed that uh, the Speaker has referred this matter to us, and that we would be expected to advise the speaker how to move forward. So to be fair to the whole exercise, I think uh, we need to arrange perhaps when the lockdown is, 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 is relaxed and that we invite these uh, gentlemen and ladies to come and make a full presentation in the portfolio committee and also to possibly invite the SACC leadership who we know that many of them were part of the SANDF, SADF and start asking them why were they not integrated and uh, by the time we finalize the whole uh, review we would be in a better position to recommend to the speaker what action must be taken. In doing so, the department itself needs to come forward on, the, on those hearings and, uh, and make a presentation. Unfortunately, if we as a portfolio committee, we say we are prepared to review, to listen to this, so it looks like uh, we would need to involve all the affected players. That's my submission. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, 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 DM? 
You may come in. It's on our DM. Chairperson, thank you very much. And once again, um, good morning to honorable members of the committee. I am not sure if I'm audible because on my side, suddenly the volume has uh, gone down. I don't know what's wrong. Yes, you are audible. Uh, I'm uh, audible. Yes, I'm I audible. can hear you. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. No, thank you very much, uh, Chair, once again uh, for the, the work done by the committee around this matter. Uh, I think the, the, re the presentation by the research, by the committee researcher and the, the legal advisor to the committee, uh, those presentations were, were very helpful. And I think uh, uh, everything they shared uh, with the committee uh, should be taken into account on how we seek to proceed on this matter, in my view. The point raised by Gen uh, Honorable uh, Holomisa, General Holomisa, <clears throat> right at the beginning about uh, what uh, uh, should Parliament do with this matter, uh, and in his view that uh, procedurally it would be proper or it, would, it appears to be the right thing that they should take up uh, the decision or the judgment of uh, of the high court uh, uh, they must they must take it up on uh, on appeal uh, <clears throat> uh, reason being uh, reason being that uh, parliament uh, is the supreme uh, custodian uh, of uh, uh, all that legal life in this country. Um, and there is nothing that parliament can do that is outside the law. So when a matter uh, of this nature has been decided upon by the courts, uh, it is for parliament to try and seek to uh, resolve the matter or to, if it is to be taken forward in any other way in line with what the court's uh, views are on the issue. We cannot ignore. Uh, I do take note uh, the comment made by uh, Honorable uh, Dennis, am I right? Uh, where he submitted that uh, the law may not always be moral. Uh, now, that uh, raises a, an even more fundamental you know, problem. Uh, what do we do with immoral laws? Uh, if uh, it is suggested that uh, the courts uh, uh, did not apply themselves, you know, uh, properly to a point of having acted immorally, I mean, that's a that's a very fundamental uh, uh, critique, sorry, sorry, sorry. and it should not be made lightly. Sorry. No? Okay, can you yes. repeat that part? I missed it. Uh, I think it was interruption. No, I was saying that uh, because uh, Parliament has to work always in unison with the courts of the country of this country, uh, uh, this matter, Parliament cannot take it forward in any other way that is in conflict with how it was uh, judged by by the courts. And I was saying that the point made by Honourable uh, Member Dennis that uh, you know the law may not always be moral it's a it's a very serious critique uh, of uh, uh, it's a very serious view of uh, the work that the courts uh, are doing and in this particular case if that's what he is suggesting may be the problem here uh, i don't know where it's taking us to but uh, i would say uh, the the the, yes. the process of how the matter is dealt with in parliament has to has unavoidably have to take into account what the court said over it. Uh, but away from that, there is a point which uh, uh, was also raised as to uh, what relief, and it was also raised by Honorable Member Dennis, what relief are the applicants seeking? Uh, and he is correct to say uh, 
the, 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 the relief could be in two respects. Uh, the one would be that, uh, you know, uh, if they are claiming to have been an entity which was overlooked during integration, even though we know now factually that they were not in existence, uh, the, the desire to want to be part of the defense establishment can be addressed, uh, but not through the integration process. Uh, all South Africans have the right to join the South African National Defense Force. And the recruitment into the Defense Force, it's an ongoing process. Uh, and as a community, if they, there is a strong sentiment that uh, they feel uh, you know, marginalized uh, from being part of the South African defense establishment, that can be addressed, but uh, it is not a matter to be dealt with through the framework of the integration process, which is now history. Um, the other point, of course, is that if the relief was, is that they were military uh, people, they were they are ex-soldiers who were not integrated, but who want to be to enjoy the status of being ex-soldiers, indeed, that provision is there. The Department of Military Veterans can process their matter. Uh, and matter of fact, the South African uh, Cape Corps has established itself as a military veterans organization, association which is today recognized by the ministry and the department. and. Uh, its members have the right to enjoy whatever privileges the uh, the act the the law that established the the department of military veterans uh, accords military veterans with that uh, or il with respect to that to benefits of being mi of military accruing to military veterans um some of them, because they are, there's evidence that they were in, the, uh, in the defense establishment before, can be, you know, uh, brought in. But of course, those who were, in terms of uh, genuine uh, information available, who were not uh, members of the South African Defense Force before, some of them who were not born at the time cannot be military veterans. So there is that actually distinction, which uh, I think uh, uh, has to be made. But of course, it's a discussion that we, we could better entertain with their participation if they were in the committee today. The last point, which uh, it's a detail, but uh, not to me very important, not a very important detail, the expectation referred to, which was cre created by a deputy, some deputy director from the ministry on this matter. Um, it, it puzzles me that uh, there would have been such an occurrence where a deputy director in the ministry uh, offered an opinion, uh, which now, as we are discussing the matter, must enjoy some status. Because uh, the reason being that all functionaries within the ministry, all functionaries within the ministry uh, do not have any uh, uh, in their line function, any powers or delegated responsibility to provide uh, responses to issues that are referred to the ministry without those issues being you know, submitted to the minister and going out uh, as responses that uh, are signed off by the minister. Matter of fact, the only people in the ministries who actually do provide opinion on matters are advisors, political advisors and technical advisors to the minister. And those do not sub, uh, provide their views directly to stakeholders. They advise the minister, and it is the, upon the minister's uh, 
uh, uh, evaluation of the advice that they give that the minister will then uh, you know, respond to whatever matter is raised. But there is no other functionary within the ministry who can respond to a matter referred to the ministry. If it's a deputy director, unless he is sitting in the department, and in which instance then that deputy director would have had to generate a memo and have the memo submitted to the immediate authority that is supervising that deputy director, and the view expressed by that deputy director would then be dealt with at that level, and so on would the process have gone. But I do not think that uh, a view expressed by a deputy director sitting in a ministry uh, would actually be uh, enjoying any status as far as this matter is concerned. I thought I should just also deal with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, DM. No, thanks, colleagues, for uh, commenting on the matter. It is clear that we can't take it any further than this, given that um, they're not uh, in the meeting and we still have not heard uh, from them. Uh, in other words, their side of uh, the, 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 the presentation. Uh, so we, I, would, I would suggest that we leave it at, at that for now. And, uh, and and I think there's a question that I think Kosi Kabekulu uh, asked whether uh, their membership includes uh, the Southwest Africans or Namibians. Uh, only them uh, the that can give us that information. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and not Hello, sir. We are Sorry. in the Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. Mr. Chair. Mr. Hawk, how are you? Yes, I'm very good, sir. Thank you. for. I have struggled a lot to come at the meeting, but I'm here. Okay. Hey. So we started the meeting at 9 o'clock. Um, the time now is half past 10. And, yes. Uh, yes. And uh, what time did you join the meeting? I'm struggling from, from uh, half past us. Pass, 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 uh, pass eight. And there are uh, a lot of troubles to come into the on the platform because there was so were you following? Yes, I, 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 I just follow now now because I cannot I all see the presentations, but I cannot see the, the video and, and sound. But I, I just came now with this guy. So, so in other words, uh, you, you couldn't hear, you couldn't see the presentation. And uh, you couldn't hear the the, the presenters uh, present. Uh, yes. And you also could not hear the discussion. I, I couldn't no, do that. Yes. Yes. Well, what we'll do, uh, Mr. Hawk, uh, given that you is now one hour, uh, what, uh, 40 minutes since the meeting started, you can see how much of the discussion you, yes. you have missed. What we'll do? We will. Uh, the, the meeting is recorded. Okay. Uh, so yes, the meeting is recorded. We will uh, send the the record of the meeting uh, to you, so Thank that you are then able to catch uh, uh, catch up uh, on the discussions. And uh, you you still have you've got your presentation. Yes. Yes, Mr. J. And um, all right. Uh, or let me invite you to to make your own presentation at this time, and uh, so you have 20 minutes because now it's 20 to 11. Uh, so it must take us to 11 o'clock. Mr. Say, I promise. I, but, I but, but after your presentation, we'll then have another round of of of, of discussions where we discuss the report, which we'll then submit to 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 the speaker. Yes, Mr. Chair, yeah. I, uh, I don't have, have my, my presentation now at the end because I, I submitted to the committee. Uh, Mr. Chair. But you, but you, you do have the slide copies. The, the co sorry, the copies of the slides. Uh, I, I got it here from your side, from uh, what I sent to you. Yes, we do have, I do have your copies. Uh, and the, so I'm, I'm actually I'm asking a question. Do you have, uh, you know, uh, hard copies of your presentation before you? 
No. We don't. I don't. Yes, sir. Sir. Yes. It's a mutter. Sir. Yes, mutter. Yes. Sir. As, as you were about to wrap up the meeting, I want to sponsor a proposal that, uh, uh, as we have said, even before your your closing uh, remarks, before uh, the member, uh, uh, the representative from the Khoisan uh, Defense uh, Force, I mean Self Defense Unit, came uh, was reconnected. We had made proposal, and I think uh, Honorable Holomisa also uh, supported that uh, we can then have, he even said we can then, when the regulation are relaxed, invite them to come into the meeting where, uh, is it the SACC will also be part of that meeting so that uh, we are able to deal with these matters simultaneously. So... My proposal is that, uh, Chair, because of time, it's now 4 to 11, uh, almost. Can we allow them, give them space, you send them the recording of the meeting, they listen, uh, they come into speed, or they are conversant with the issues that uh, were discussed from, from, from the two presentations, and then we'll call them in another meeting where they will be ready to present uh, uh, their side of the story. I think that was the proposal that uh, uh, had been supported. Yes, yes, uh, Mr. Mutle, uh, that matter was raised. Uh, by then, they had not joined in, and uh, now they have joined uh, the meeting. But the only difficulty now is that they don't have the hard copies. Uh, they don't have the electronic version. They don't even have the hard copies of their presentation. Now, given this situation, would uh, want to adjourn the meeting now uh, to afford you sufficient time first to go through uh, to the record of this meeting since we started from nine o'clock, so that in your presentation you, you also incorporate uh, your comments uh, to the discussions that we have just had. So that meeting will decide when it is going to take place and we'll look at the program and then come back to you through the channels that we have been using in communicating with you. I'm sure you'll find that in order, uh, Mr. Hope. I find it in order, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. So you I think your, our meeting with you guys is now, uh, with, sorry, with, with the Khoisan Nation Self-Defense Unit is adjourned. We'll now move to another item on the agenda. That does not concern you. So okay. you may then uh, leave the meeting. Uh, but our meetings are public. It doesn't matter. But you may leave the meeting if you so wish. We we'll now Thank want to you. move to another item on the agenda. Thank you very much for coming in. Let's hope next time you will not have the same challenges and uh, that you have heard today. Uh, but the suggestion is that we, we, we have another time when we are in parliament and we are in the same venue and um, because, because given the problems that you have experienced. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hope. Uh, thank we'll you, Mr. Again. Yes, thank you. All right, colleagues, uh, we'll end this meeting. In other words, we are adjourning the item uh, to allow time for the colleagues, uh, the, the Khoisans, to reflect, to reflect on the discussions and then make their own uh, presentation. All right, thank you so much. Uh, let's move off to the second item on the agenda. Uh, the second item on the agenda is a, a briefing uh, by the Ministry of, of Defense um, on issues affecting the Department of Military uh, Veterans. Um, DM, I think you, you, you are in the meeting. Uh, like you said, uh, you will take us through the issues. DM, in, in the presentation by the, the department, in their own admission, uh, they, they said there is instability in strategic leadership uh, in the department. We can confirm that, DM. Uh, the, there is an acting uh, director general. Uh, there's never been a, 
Yeah, the last time we had an, a, a director general, I can't remember the year, but uh, I think it was in 2015. That was the last time we had a, 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 a commissioned a director general in the name of uh, Mr. Mutumi. Since then, we have had, I think, four uh, uh, people acting. It was the Secretary for Defense, the CFO for Defense at some point, uh, Mr. Ozinski at some other point, and now we have the, the General Mkwebi acting in the position. And uh, that is not the only challenge. Another challenge are the vacancies at senior management level uh, within the department that have not that have been vacant for quite some time, and uh, that's that's one part. And the second part is the structure of the department uh, general, the 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 organizational structure that was uh, uh, you know uh, approved in twenty. 20, what year was it? But it was ahead, uh, ahead of the, ahead of the, the structure was approved ahead of the the, the vision and mission uh, of, of the department. And uh, <clears throat> you know, there was the, 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 the post, the post were determined ahead of the structure. And uh, so at the time, the, the post that was suggested uh, were about 400 uh, post uh, plus, and uh, and the treasury approved 169 uh, post. Uh, and uh, since then, we have created as a department created uh, well over 70 uh, contract post, and they say due to inaccurate uh, what you call due to uh, operational uh, reasons. And uh, we're also told that the structure is not also aligned to the service delivery uh, model of the department. Well, yeah, so, and, and that there is inappropriate uh, organizational culture uh, in the institution. We understand why it's because of the inability, sorry, instability in the strategic uh, management and the structure that is not organized, aligned, so it's not aligned to uh, the service delivery model of the department. That will reflect in the operational uh, efficiencies um, in, the, in, in, in the department. So we thought uh, we should uh, have a, a meeting with the minister uh, because we're now at a point where we're being requested to approve the budget of the department. And uh, for the first time this year, the department would be a standalone department, uh, is vote uh, 26. So it concerns the committee that we are uh, passing the budget uh, uh, under the, what you call, uh, the, the, the situation. We were also told that there are uh, policies that are critical to uh, service delivery that are not yet in place. And we thought, man, look, uh, these are matters that uh, have been raised with us uh, since we first met with the department. And some of them, I think the majority of them have not been resolved. And uh, so we thought we must escalate these issues to the level of the minister. Another very key aspect, uh, DM, is the is, is the database, uh, which is the backbone of the department. I mean, uh, there's been serious challenges with the uh, database. We've set timelines by which we thought the department would have completed, it cleaned it up and produced uh, one document that is free of any, uh, uh, what you call, uh, inaccuracies. Uh, but the department hasn't been able to uh, discharge that responsibility. We are now in 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 in, in May, and um, we are still sitting with the same uh, problems. DM, you may want to talk to us, and uh, and convey the message of the minister to the the, the portfolio committee. Just a word of comfort that uh, the minister is aware of these challenges, 
and uh, that it is dealing with them, and that you also have a turnaround plan at an executive level, turnaround plan, and with clear timelines to deal with this with it, to deal with this problem. So we invite you, DM, to make a comment. Uh, okay. Okay, person. Uh, chair, am I audible? Yes, you are, sir. You are audible. Um, now, thank you very much, uh, Chair and uh, committee members, again. Uh, I'm unable to establish, Chair, if the minister is uh, linked up in this meeting. Uh, I see we've got 25 participants, if I'm not making a mistake. I'm not sure if the minister is also part of the meeting. May, may, may I check, may I check uh, colleagues from the, min from the ministry? Uh, I know the DM is here, and uh, is, there anyone, is, is the minister part of the meeting? Uh, Chairperson? Yes, sir. Uh, Chair, I was advised by the minister's PLO that she will not be able to 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 join us in the meeting. Uh, we are alerted to that just as we had were commencing the meeting. All right. So that that that, that is the uh, status uh, DM. Uh, <clears throat> no, thank you. thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I was uh, establishing whether uh, the minister is with us, it is because uh, uh, the matters the committee is interested in, uh, the minister's office would possibly have uh, more uh, accurate information around them. Uh, <clears throat> to be shared with the committee. Uh, however, Chair, let me proceed by uh, first referring the committee to a document that uh, we received yesterday from the department, which I'm not sure if it was forwarded to the committee, Chair. It is a, a report on the list of questions that the portfolio committee raised with the department I think this would have been at the last meeting when they presented the strategic plans and the annual performance plans of the department. I don't know if you have that document. It lists 11 questions and the responses to those 11 questions. I have gone through them and uh, I, I do have uh, things that I can share with the committee around these 11 questions. If that is uh, a useful uh, uh, way of going through the discussion of the issues around the department. Yes, the, um, th those questions deal largely with operational issues. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we thought we should not utilize a meeting with at, at this level, uh, with the meeting, we sorry, with the minister to deal with matters that can best be dealt with by the, the, the officials. And uh, I doubt if it answers um, when are you going to align the, to review the, the organogram. It doesn't. In other words, the issues we wanted to discuss with, with, with the minister are fundamental. Uh, that only the minister and uh, only the ministry can deal with. You know, the appointment of, of, an, of, of, of an HOD, you know, the, sorry, the, the director general, right? I doubt the Director General can actually you know, deal with that uh, question sufficiently. Only the Minister uh, can deal with that. The, uh, the alignment of the structure, you know, reviewing the current structure, only the Minister is the peer view of the, of the Minister. Let, let's not deal with the organizational issues. If in those responses there are issues that you think are, are not operational and you can deal with and uh, sufficiently to address the, the concerns of the of the committee, I will, I will welcome that. No, thank you, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> firstly, with respect to the uh, challenge in the department's leadership of uh, acting incumbents in a number of key areas, um, that matter has been 
uh, of serious concern uh, to to the ministry. Um, and um, one noted that it is a matter which the the review of the auditor general uh, conducted on the on the annual performance plan submitted to parliament raises this matter uh, that uh, the accounting officer position has been you know vacant since the 1st of august 2015 uh, and that the deputy director general's position as well for social economic support has been vacant since january 2017 and that the deputy director general corporate services also became vacant in september on the 1st of september last year 2019 uh, <clears throat> i I am aware that uh, this was brought to the attention of the uh, acting director general uh, as, uh, uh, early enough as uh, you know uh, six uh, six months into this uh, administration's term of office, which would have been December last year. Uh, formal correspondence was generated to the 18th Director General's office to say uh, all these posts must be advertised uh, as a matter of agency because uh, if uh, we do not have uh, full-time incumbents in these leadership positions, they are too strategic for us uh, to make much difference in correcting uh, the weaknesses of the department. Uh, I am aware that uh, the minister uh, was dealing with the moratorium on the appointment of uh, DGs that was placed across the board within the uh, departments. But uh, the minister agreed that he will engage, she will engage rather with the minister of uh, uh, DPSA to seek uh, 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 the privilege to get the position to be filled because as uh, the committee has just said, it is now five years that the department has not had uh, a full-time uh, DG. Uh, I am not uh, uh, able to uh, provide further information to that decision, how the minister uh, fared in relation to her engagement with the Minister of uh, DPSA on this matter. Uh, it's something which, um, as soon as the Minister is available, uh, should assist uh, in providing clarity. There is also, of course, the point that uh, these uh, other uh, positions like the DTG social economic support and most importantly, DDG also uh, the DDG responsible for corporate services. Uh, that uh, those posts also needed to be fit. Um, we 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 also are uh, concerned that uh, the moratorium that uh, we have uh, is actually going to make things very difficult for us especially in relation to the DDG corporate services, because uh, the decision taken by Treasury to eventually give the department uh, a stand, uh, standalone status as a vote, as uh, the committee is aware that uh, the department's vote from the 1st of April is a standalone vote, vote 26. Uh, it means that uh, uh, the department's uh, admin uh, uh, areas must all have the requisite policies so that uh, at the end of the financial year uh, there should be you know proper accounting for all of the resources uh, that uh, the department would have received there is uh, of course uh, the point about the structure of the department uh, we have raised all of the matters that uh, I must just say to the committee, that the committee is concerned with are very appropriate and, uh, and, and, uh, and crucial uh, weaknesses of the department. As early as June, in June last year, a month after this new administration uh, was put in place, we had a meeting with the 
top management of the department to discuss the status quo uh, in the department. Uh, and the issue about the structure of the department, which does not lend itself to the delivery the department must realize, was raised, and we agreed that uh, there must be a uh, uh, work done around this. They needed to establish a project team that will do a re-evaluation of the, you know, uh, structure of the department to make sure that uh, it conforms with the policy precepts of the department, in particular in relation to the sharp end of the department uh, as a, a design to. Uh, give the necessary, you know, capacities for the department to, to, live, to deliver in all of the key the delivery areas that the department's policy directs us in, I mean, I mean on. That work has not been done. I have looked at the responses uh, of uh, the department that were provided yesterday. Uh, it was as if you know, we have not had a, I mean, a discussion. I must confess, I was actually disappointed that uh, uh, there's just been no movement with respect to that. There is also, of course, uh, an issue that uh, the, the department has, from its inception, functioned on the basis of what was an interim policy. An interim policy that was put in place by a ministerial task team that the Minister of Defense and Military Veterans put in place in 2009. And that ministerial task team, the uh, uh, interim uh, uh, report, I mean, uh, interim policy, uh, in its report, uh, the, the, the task team uh, advised that the uh, the, the ministry and the and the ministry must proceed to uh, introduce legislation in parliament for the provision of a legal framework to deliver support to military veterans, but that the going forward there should be a process that allows for a full fully fledged. Uh, public uh, discourse around uh, what should be in government the policy that uh, we uh, observe in support in supporting military veterans in our country that of course is work that has not uh, uh, happened and uh, we make the committee uh, i mean the management committee of the department aware that it is an agent a project to be embarked upon. And I see in the report again, I'm sorry to make reference to this uh, report that was uh, submitted yesterday, now and again here, but in that report, they still are repeating the things they were telling us, which was that uh, uh, the long and short of it, that uh, the white paper process can only be uh, executed to be completed and be completed in 2022. Uh, a, a notion which uh, was uh, flatly, you know, uh, objected to in the ministry, and we actually advised them. And I'm talking now the latest meeting two weeks ago, advised them of uh, the steps that we can take to shorten the process of getting the white paper uh, ready on the basis of which the amendment to the legislation, the Military Veterans Act of 2011, can be effected. Uh, from the report, it is again clear that uh, we are not moving. Uh, I personally get a sense that uh, it could be that uh, the management is not uh, uh, courageous enough to be open about the capacity we have in the department to address some of these big issues that the department must, uh, must tackle. And as a result, there is this syndrome of uh, actually moving around uh, in circle and having 
you know, discussions where we repeat ourselves, but without any movement uh, uh, forward. Um, uh, if the minister was uh, in the meeting, should be able to, you know, uh, more authoritatively, you know, comment about uh, what uh, needs to be done, you know, uh, going forward in relation to this matter. But uh, I must say that uh, the department's uh, management has not, you know, come to the party in relation to what we must do to get the structure uh, re reviewed uh, and also to get uh, the main overarching policy of this department, uh, you know, subjected to an inclusive, rigorous discussion that can lead to an amendment of the act. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, another uh, area where we have indicated to the department that uh, uh, something can immediately be done to bring relief to the constraint of the department in delivering uh, its mandate, which is that uh, the limitations that are there in the legislation, uh, some of them are actually not, uh, uh, there is, let me see, there, there is uh, another way in which we could actually make up for those limitations. Uh, the amendments to the regulations that are in place now for the delivery of the different uh, benefits can actually make the department to make interventions uh, that are more meaningful. If I may just give an example, for instance, we do have a policy on housing, but that policy on housing says the department will provide housing to the principal members. But we know that the Housing for principal members for these military veterans, their housing, it's uh, an intervention that does not just assist themselves as individuals, but it also includes uh, bringing comfort to their families, to their dependents as well, to provide a roof over their head. Situations happen that uh, military veterans die whilst waiting for houses to be released to them. But once they have... Uh, uh, they've perished. The dependence of these military veterans, uh, the policy does not uh, say they are or they will remain entitled to be housed. Uh, something which uh, uh, in, it's a constraint in the regulations that uh, we are unable to proceed to provide to release those houses to the dependents after the military veteran, uh, the deserving military veteran has died. Whereas the spirit, the letter and spirit of these uh, you know, legal frameworks were, was not that dependents must be deprived of the privilege to be housed once the principal member has, uh, has passed on. These are examples, this is just one of the examples of the challenges we could easily have un, uh, unlocked by uh, reviewing the regulations and making the regulations to be user-friendly in order to expedite delivery of some of these benefits. This matter was raised with this management of the department, as I'm saying, right at the beginning when we started in June last year, and to this point, nothing has done. And even in the report that was provided yesterday, still nothing was done in relation to re uh, work that reviewed the re regulations and uh, work that has uh, come up with proposal around the standard operating procedures in the delivery of these, uh, of these regulations. It is, again, another area where we have been concerned about uh, uh, the performance of the uh, top management of this, uh, of this department. Let me move on, uh, Chair, to say that uh, there is, of course, another problem at a strategic level, which is that uh, there is an evident uh, uh, poor enforcement of uh, consequence management a whole host of uh, irregularities uh, contained in the reports of the department. But uh, 
action to get uh, uh, matters processed, those involved given the opportunity to explain themselves, where it is established fairly so that uh, functionaries have uh, misdirected themselves or they have uh, taken irregular decisions that there be consequences in order to correct those uh, uh, irregularities. There is just no evidence of any movement on this. And the Auditor General's review of the annual plans and performance plans raises this matter again. Um, among others, it makes the point that investigations to determine whether assets were lost, stolen, or deposed have not been concluded. And the number of these assets increases year to year, meaning the loss of assets increases from year to year, but still there are no reports that indicate that investigations were conducted and that uh, steps have been taken uh, to get things corrected. Uh, it is, uh, from my side, uh, uh, a very, uh, you know, brief sketching of uh, the strategic challenges that the department uh, is confronted with. I am aware that, uh, among other things, the committee has raised the observation that an audit of skills, of the skills base of the department was uh, embarked upon. And the committee was keen to understand how far that project went and when will it be concluded. In the report to the committee, and I think this was in uh, February by the department, uh, uh, we have since uh, uh, established and agreed with management that uh, the picture uh, painted to the committee by management was uh, unfortunately uh, inaccurate. Uh, around uh, what is happening to this project on skills uh, audit. Uh, that project uh, is a project which, uh, uh, to cut the long story short, was uh, irregular and uh, fruitless expenditure uh, in that the objectives of that skills audit are far from being met and the project had actually been uh, uh, abandoned by the service provider. The service provider has walked away. The service provider has been paid for the entire work that was uh, uh, sketched for them to execute. Uh, however, at the point when the project was stopped and the service provider walked away, not all of that work was done. Not all of the employees were taken through that exercise to check and to evaluate their skills to know in what areas they needed to be uh, in capa I mean, capacitated. Uh, and so uh, even uh, with respect to an important project like that, that would uh, strategically help to improve the situation, things have just not been handled uh, uh, the right way. So we, we, we are concerned about that. And in our discussion with the department, we have agreed that they must come back to the committee and correct the picture that they have painted to the committee, provide the right and accurate information and be factual and indicate what they propose, uh, they are proposing is going to be the way forward on the matter. As far as uh, my view is concerned, uh, colleagues, uh, members of the committee, uh, the department uh, is very, very low as far as the human resource capacity that it needs. We do not let alone the shortage of skills, but we do not have adequate warm bodies there. And that problem also uh, arises out of what we talked about earlier on the vacancies at strategic uh, level that are there within the department. Uh, that uh, to prioritize uh, the pursuing of a skills audit uh, uh, may be an effort which does not give us mass, much mileage, doesn't give us much headway to 
getting uh, the department to get the requisite capacities, uh, we need to first make it a point that the strategic leadership is recruited into the department, the posts are filled, and people are utilized in roles that they can perform better, even before we can say who has what skills. Uh, that is just my observation, of course, subject to an evaluation of these issues by the committee from where committee members sit. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. No, thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, DM. It was a uh, mouthful. Uh, but what, what you are not telling us is what are you doing about these challenges? But uh, that's a discussion for another time. Uh, let me just recognize uh, hands. Uh, General Olumesa. Uh, thank you. Any other hand, colleagues? I'm Any other hand? Hello? Hello? Hi. Yes. Shalembe. Shalembe. Uh, and Ryder, please. Mr. Ryder. JJ Marke. Uh, Mr. Marke. <laughs> All right, I'll take this for for now. Uh, I'll start with you, General, then Shalembe, then Mr. Ryder, then Mr. Make. Uh, over you to General. Thank you, Chairperson, and ch thank you to our Deputy Minister. I think uh, the picture which has just been painted by the DM uh, renders this de debate today uh, useless, if I may call it. We need to have in the next meeting the minister and the sector, the accounting officer. For them to say we must have an independent status for the purposes of, uh, of, of, of budgeting starting this year, I don't think we would be doing a good justice. This sector must still be in charge for this uh, department until the whole exercise has been completed. It's true that uh, there is an instability when you listen to the minister, the minister, uh, deputy minister's presentation. Perhaps that's why the minister ran away today. How on earth he would just uh, say he's not coming on the last hour? So she knew that uh, he, she cannot, or she was part of this instability. We need to, to speak to her, and she must come with her top management of the department. Perhaps if we talk about structure uh, as a problem, if they don't have capacity within the department, why can they go to public service commission? Public service commission can second work study officers to help them. This is an embarrassing, to say the least. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Shalembe. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, firstly, let me say uh, I appreciate, I mean, um, the presentation that has been done by uh, the DM. Well, uh, his courage, I mean, to come forward and give us the information, I think is uh, really um, uh, appreciated. But I'm looking now to the issue of, I mean, the instability in the leadership position. Um, now, what I'm hearing from the DM is that now we need to prioritize, I mean, the issue of filling the vacancies uh, versus the issue of the skills audit. Well, uh, as fine, it's a good idea. But the concern that I have, what is put in here, I think it was going to have, I mean, um, uh, a good contribution if the minister was uh, here as well. Now, the minister has got, I mean, uh, the powers and uh, to and is, is accountable, but the minister is not uh, available and I'm disturbed that the DM has asked if the minister was in the meeting. So it means now this uh, is telling us that there is no communication between uh, the minister and the uh, DM, which is not good. And it also contributes to the instability in the department. 
Now, I would, I mean, uh, suggest that uh, let the minister be uh, requested to come uh, and engage with us, rather than saying in the last minute the minister now is not available. And if you look the consequences of the instability in the department is suffering uh, to, I mean, it, it, the, 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 the military veterans as well as their family, families. I would suggest that, Chairperson, we do not, I mean, uh, go much on these issues until, I mean, the minister avail, avail herself so that, I mean, an informed decision is taken. I really appreciate the presence of the, the DM, but I think the minister should, I mean, uh, make efforts to come forward and work with the committee and address uh, this uh, situation, which we see it will, I mean, endanger the functioning of the department in the near future. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shalembe. Uh, Mr. Reja. Thank you very much, Chair. I think Mr. Shalembe makes a wonderful point that uh, we must never forget that the work or the failure to work by this department uh, affects people's lives directly. And it's people that have uh, um, given service to their country um, and, and it's acknowledged that there's a debt owed to them. Uh, and the rules and the, the regulations are in place. Um, work needs to be done. Uh, government has an obligation in this in, in this regard. So I want to make an observation firstly, uh, and then just ask one question. Um, my observation is that uh, I believe that asking the current administration to drive the process of redesigning the organigram and, and, and the structure of the department uh, is a little bit like asking the turkeys to organize Christmas lunch. Um, you know, it's going to affect them directly. And uh, perhaps that is part of the reason for the reluctance uh, to, to push forward on this or the, or the inability to, to push it through. Because obviously to, to design something that may affect your own livelihood uh, m might put you in a, in a di dilemma. Um, so I believe that driving of that redesign process needs to happen from, from somewhere else. And perhaps uh, the minister and the DM need to actually sit down uh, in a la hotla of some sorts and drive that process themselves um, and ensure that the administration are given the direction that, that is needed. So that's my observation. The question that I have uh, relates to comments from the Deputy Minister where he said that the picture painted to the committee on the skills audit was inaccurate. So Effectively, what he's saying there is that people came and misled Parliament. Um, and by then bringing in the, the aspect that there was, in fact, fruitless expenditure, fruitless and wasteful expenditure incurred here, that policies, uh, procurement policies were not followed and people were paid before the work was completed, uh, means that there may actually have been willful, uh, a, a willful intention to mislead Parliament by the people that came and presented to us. And I want to know if there's disciplinary action uh, in process in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mackey? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, well, most of the things have, have been covered. But uh, where I liked the openness and honesty uh, that the Deputy Minister have presented the whole scenario in there. Just one question. Uh, I remember at some stage the minister took, uh, I don't know how it is called, but the powers of the deputy minister who was responsible for, for military veterans. I'm not sure whether that was restored up to now. Or is the situation still as it was at that time? That made me understand the situation to be that at that point it means the Department of Military Veterans was under some sort of an administration. 
meaning that the minister is directly responsible for everything that happens in there. Well, well, she's always directly. Uh, but this time, if there's nobody responsible, it's herself. So at least if we can get a report on that one, uh, is, is the department still under uh, what I'm, uh, I, I will term administration, or has it gone back to normal? And, and uh, maybe if, because I remember at some stage we sent the department back or no, you didn't come with the report that we wanted. But still nothing is forthcoming, as the deputy minister said, or there's no con- consequence management in there. So maybe if we can get the status of the department as of now, is it quarantined? Uh, uh, meaning that is, is it still under administration or uh, things are back to normal? Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, all right, uh, are there any other hands, colleagues, before I let the the DM uh, uh, give us the answers? Uh, yes, Mr. Mafanya. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson. And I would like also to thank the DM for this informative information that they has given us. The Actually, we are back to square one where we were last week. And uh, the buck stops with the minister. Now, the question that arises is that the, if the principal being the minister doesn't adhere to to the request of the committee. What happens? What remedies, what recourse do we have so that she avails herself? Because the department itself of military veterans is in the ICU. Secondly, there are also these amendments, veteran, vet, uh, military veterans uh, amendment act. It has been sitting there for five solid years and nothing happened. And we are sitting again today discussing the same thing. So my question would be, what should happen in relation to where the minister does not show up? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. All right, uh, colleagues, uh, <clears throat> I want to inform you that soon after the meeting, I wrote to the minister. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> bringing to her attention uh, the discomfort of the portfolio committee in relation to the issues that you have mentioned. Uh, you are not mentioning these issues for the first time, and you have been mentioning them all over again. This is a letter I wrote uh, to, to the minister. Uh, is that uh, the Portfolio Committee of Defense and Military Veterans held a meeting on Friday, the 15th May 2020, with the Department of Military Veterans on its strategic plan, annual plan, and the budget uh, 2021. It is, it is regrettable that the Minister and the Deputy Minister could not be available to this meeting, with your apologies having been noted. During the deliberations, the committee identified the challenges which affect the efficiency and effectiveness of the department in carrying out uh, its mandate. These challenges include uh, the organizational structure of the DMV, uh, its change management, and the uh, end outstanding policies which are key to its, its functioning. In view of the fact that the acting general role is limited in carrying out these challenges, the committee formed the view that the executive authority will be better placed in responding to these challenges that affect the Department of Military Veterans. The committee had planned to adopt the budget vote report on the, of the DMV in the next meeting of the 22nd May 2020, but we are compelled to postpone the adoption of the report to a later date in order to engage the engage with the minister prior to the adoption. We therefore wish to invite the minister 
to the meeting of the 22nd of May 2020 in order to dispense with, with the matters affecting the DMV. This engagement will uh, place the committee in an improved position to pass the budget of the DMV in a subsequent, uh, what you call, a subsequent meeting. So, uh, I'm, I'm, this report, this uh, letter, this email or letter is yet to be responded to. But we thought uh, today it would be an opportunity for the minister to give us comfort that the matters are being attended to. Because, I mean, when the committee says the structure was approved ahead of the founding legislation, vision and mission of the department, and that the structure is not aligned to the service delivery uh, model of the department, and that there is a uh, visible instability uh, in the strategic leadership of the department. We thought these matters were, uh, you know, compelling enough to uh, raise the interest of the minister uh, uh, and then a comment, uh, you know, address us on, on these matters. So, because the question always remains, we have uh, diagnosed these matters. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But we're not, we're not where we're not anywhere nearer to uh, finding a resolution to, to the problem. And uh, yes, ours, we can hold the ministry to account, we can hold the department to account, but <clears throat> beyond that, uh, you know, there's, I don't know, there isn't much we, 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 can, we can do, uh, except really, because only the minister can fix the problems that we have identified. The structure is the is the minister's function. The leadership of the department, uh, stroke HR, is the minister's function. And the uh, the amendment to the to the act and the regulation to provide for clarity on the issue of housing, to provide clarity on the issues of uh, uh, public transport subsidy, to provide the clarity on the issue of military health of uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, vet, uh, military. Uh, issues of health uh, care of uh, military veterans. It's 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 those are policy matters, and they are the minister's function. Now, with what we have before us, it's clear that we are still back uh, to square one, and so we thought uh, probably um, <clears throat> we 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 need this discussion uh, with her, but she's not, unfortunately, not in the meeting. Colleagues, um, I think we have uh, spoken on, on this, and uh, let me le allow uh, the DM just to comment after which we close the meeting. It's clear we're not, we're not, we're still back to where we are, we were in the last uh, uh, meeting. We haven't uh, made any, any improvement, and um, we'll look at the issue again when we consider the report and uh, sometime next week. I am not, I've not been given the date as yet. Uh, Brian will talk to the date uh, towards the end of this meeting, when we'll consider the, the report of the of the Department of Military Veterans. It, it is in that report that will reflect on some of these issues and present them uh, before before Parliament. Thank you so much. Uh, over to uh, Mr. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. Uh, uh, Chair, thank you very much, and I hope you, I'm you, audible. You, you can go as far as you can go, Deputy Minister. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair and committee members again. Um, <clears throat> the the comments and sentiments of, uh, of the committee members uh, are, 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 are appreciated. Let me first... Uh, uh, make the committee aware that the Department of Military Veterans is now uh, a dedicated responsibility uh, to the office of the Deputy Minister from last uh, from from April from last month uh, about three weeks or so ago. Uh, <clears throat> there is a. a a situation that uh, there has not been uh, from the time the new administration was uh, in place uh, a 
clarification, not a clarification rather, but the delegation of responsibilities uh, within the ministry to the different uh, uh, areas uh, of the work of the two departments, both defense and military veterans. Uh, but also to say that uh, the delegation to the uh, office of the deputy minister involve uh, specifically the matter that we are grappling with here, which is that uh, the department has to have a credible, uh, up-to-date uh, structural formation to deliver on its mandate. That is specifically mentioned among the issues that are delegated to the office of the deputy minister. And I must uh, uh, make here a commitment to the committee that working with the committee, we will get this project uh, executed and uh, we'll get it off the ground. Um, and um, about a week or so ago, we also uh, agreed on the, the procedures of accountability of the accounting officers of both the Department of Defense and Military Veterans in relation to those areas that are delegated to the office of the Deputy Minister. Because as members would be aware that uh, in relation to the line of authority of the execution and implementation of anything that the departments do, the office of the deputy minister uh, does not feature in that uh, line of authority. Uh, but we have uh, since agreed with the accounting officers, as I'm saying at the Council of Defense, that uh, there is a uh, now an understanding of how these delegated areas will be dealt with. The second point, of course, that I wanted to make is that uh, uh, General Holomisa, Honorable Holomisa, is correct that, uh, uh, and it is a view which uh, uh, my office also shares, that uh, the decision in this financial year to accord the Department of Military Veterans a stand-alone vote may actually be putting the cart before the horse as far as our ability in that department to do all of the things that a stand-alone department or stand a department which is a stand-alone vote has to be able, uh, must be able to, to do. Uh, we may at the end of the financial year uh, find that uh, we are deeper in problems than uh, uh, we were before we, we enjoyed this status. Uh, but uh, because it's a decision which has already been effected, I am not uh, sure, and this is clarity we are going to have to seek um, about uh, how this matter can best be dealt with. I also agree with the Honorable uh, Dennis that this project uh, can only succeed if it is handled, it is anchored in a leadership team that is uh, outside of the department's uh, management, you know, uh, echelons, because uh, they are invariably, individually, and at times as collectives, affected or will be affected unavoidably by this process uh, and they may find it uh, um, difficult not to avoid the temptation of being dysfunctional in the process of the implementation of the project. Um, and over and above that, of course, a project of this nature has always been better assisted by having technical capacity that is brought in uh, from outside of the organization itself. Because, because uh, indeed, it could be that the 
management uh, capacity that is there is technically not uh, adequate to deal with this matter and uh, advise, of course, that uh, the Department of uh, DPSA is a play first port of call on matters of this nature is actually very uh, uh, correct. And that is something that we are going to do. Together with DPSA, we will see what they advise uh, we procure uh, if uh, we do not have capacity-wise internally from outside in order to get this project done. But we will certainly prioritize this. Uh, I can you know, guarantee the, poly the, the, the committee, the portfolio committee, that by the end of this financial year, the issue around structure, uh, the reorganization of the structure of the department will, be, will have been dealt with. The point about uh, the skills audit, uh, we have agreed with management that they have to come back to the portfolio committee to clear and uh, even tender an apology for the inaccurate information that was shared in part around the skills audit in their last presentation in February, uh, because uh, there are consequence management decisions that need to be taken around that project. Uh, and the committee, portfolio committee must be aware of those things. So we will indeed uh, get that misleading picture, you know, corrected at our next, uh, at the uh, department's next appearance before the committee. I think the issue raised by uh, uh, Honorable, Honorable Marke about the DMV having been directly uh, supervised from the minister's office before is correct. And I think I've answered it to say uh, from last month in April, it is one of the delegated uh, responsibilities to the office of the deputy minister. For clarity's sake, I must just underline this to the committee, that, which is that uh, it is not the department that is delegated. It is certain tasks and priorities in the department that have been dedicated. And uh, I think it is only proper that that information on the delegation be uh, something the committee is privy to, because for the committee to play its oversight role properly, it must know in the ministry which area of the functions uh, or the responsibilities of the departments are actually delegated to the office of the deputy minister. I don't think that it is uh, something which should be a problem. Uh, otherwise, uh, I agree with the sentiments of the committee. Uh, there is uh, work to be done and uh, working together, uh, the committee and the ministry, we must get things right within the Department of Military Veterans. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, the DM, uh, for uh, the way you handled the the methods. And the colleagues, uh, I think we have reached the end of the the meeting. Um, it's clear that there are issues that we must still follow up on, and uh, as it were. Um, uh, they were tabulated. It's uh, uh, a pity that we we can't um, we get uh, you know clear timelines. But let's take the DM's word that uh, the matters uh, would be resolved by the end of this uh, uh, financial year. Uh, DM, uh, I uh, the 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 post of the director general is filled uh, in an acting capacity. In other words, there's incumbent who are paying money, and uh, and and I thought it's a critical post. And uh, why it would really need, uh, you know, uh, the Department of Public uh, Service and Administration to concur to filling the post? It's, it's just not clear to me because we are already paying somebody in that post, someone in that post. And uh, the, the acting director general was appointed from May 
uh, for about a year from May to April, May, they're about. And uh, now is in his second year. I mean, this May will be completing uh, his second year in, 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 in the post. So, and uh, now it, it, it points to something more that there isn't, there is, there is no willingness and uh, political will to fix the problem. But now with the undertaking you are making, uh, <clears throat> we will uh, live with that uh, for now and we will tie you down to the undertakings we have made uh, today. I've tabulated each one of them and uh, uh, you know things that will have to be fixed so that we can then address the operational inefficiencies in the department. We did not want to raise uh, areas of underperformance in the department where you underperformed against a number of targets because we thought that, that was the, there is a causal link between the structure, stroke instability uh, at a strategic level on one hand and the performance uh, on the other. There is a causation between the two. And uh, hence we focused on this. Uh, we can't go beyond this. It's sufficient what we have done. We have taken issues. Uh, we have noted all of them. We hope to meet again uh, next time. Is it? I think DM would meet with you. We're not going to let you, uh, uh, you know, we will not, uh, you know, take a decision that would meet with you towards the end of the financial year. We'd want to get an uh, update, you know, uh, you know, periodically. And uh, will it be proper if we ask you to update us uh, quarterly on what you are doing to in, in trying to deal with the problems that uh, we have that have been identified? So now, uh, uh, yeah, I, I take I take this as the first quarter. You now the second quarter will end in three months' time from June. That's July, August, September. End of uh, end of September. Can we? Will it be fine to? Will it be fair if I ask you to give us a progress report on some of on the issues that you have spoken about? Uh, Chair, that's perfectly in order. Quarterly reports on progress with respect to these uh, uh, big issues by the department will be appropriate. Will be appropriate. Colleagues, uh, can we end this meeting on that note? Uh, do I get your concurrence? So you have. On my Thank side. you. Agreed. Yes, agreed. All right. Okay, there is no objection to it. Colleagues, uh, may I then thank you for attending the meeting, and we hope we'll meet again in, in, in the next quarter to deliberate on, 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 on these matters. And uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Deputy Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you. Thank you.